everyone again here today, especially in this time that we have to worship the Lord, to, to serve Him acceptably. I'm thankful that we have an opportunity to do that today, even though many are out of town. Now, we do have a number who are visiting with us. We want you to know how, how blessed we are and how much we appreciate the fact that you have come to be with us today. It's uh, very much a, a pleasure for us to meet you and to know more about you, and, um, and I'm very thankful that you're here. I just wanted to make one note with regard to the, um, the uh, men's meeting. It was mentioned it's here on the ride, and I think that's probably the best thing, but normally we have the group four meeting as well. But all of the men will be in our meeting. It's something we need to do today, and I apologize for that. So I would ask the other members of the group four meeting, typically, to instead take one of the take a minute sheets as they leave and just make sure that, that uh, you do as your part in, in, uh, in trying to contact our visitors and, and, and pray for the ones that are in need for prayers. And, and if you have any questions about any of that, uh, then please talk with me at some time. Call me, text me, email me, whatever the case may be, and we'll take care of it that way just, just this one week. I would like you to turn with me to Psalm 110, uh, which was the reading uh, that we followed today in our, um, our scripture reading, Psalm 110. And there are only seven verses in that psalm. I appreciate very much Albert reading it for us. Well, Go ahead, since there are only a few verses here, read it, read it again. It's not a very long psalm. And uh, let me put the slide up, and we'll begin in just a moment. But if you will, turn with me to Psalm 110, and we will read the seven verses and use them as a, as a discussion in our lesson today. This is one of the readings that we have had um, in our daily reading, if you're following that particular schedule. Uh, it's, it's a couple of weeks old because I wasn't here last week. So I couldn't preach it. Uh, and, uh, and also I have another one that I want to preach, not on scripture reading, but another one that I, I'm not going to preach till next week because we had our singing today. So uh, uh, I'm a little bit frustrated not getting the material out as of yet, but I'm, I'm uh, glad to be able to talk about this psalm because it's such an important one. The Lord said to my right Lord, uh, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power and the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge, judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries, and he shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. Now, the 110th Psalm you may recognize as a messianic psalm. and In fact, it's one of the most referenced texts, in fact, the most referenced text in all of the New Testament. In other words, there are more allusions to and quotations from Psalm 110. In fact, about twice as many as any other text in the Old Testament. You can go through the New Testament, you'll find verse after verse after verse that are quoted. But uh, one estimate I came across is that the 110th Psalm has either been alluded to or quoted 23 different times by the New Testament writers, which is twice as many as any other New Test uh, Old Testament text uh, being referred to in the New Testament. Now, the best way to understand the context and the content of this passage is to accept the truth of the sentiments that are expressed in the first verse. Uh, this is, in fact, a psalm of David, as indicated by the heading. And, um, and in regard to that, as always, modernist critics seek to cast doubt upon the fact that, that, uh, that David was the one who wrote the psalm, but Jesus himself actually attributed it to King King David, I want you to note Matthew chapter 22 and verse 41, when the Pharisees were gathered together, that Jesus talked with them and he said, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Of course, their reference back would be the fact that he would be of the genealogy of David. And they said to him, he's the son of David. So he said to them in verse 43, well, then how then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, 
the Lord said to my Lord, sit at the right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now that's a quotation from this particular psalm. So it is David who Jesus said, said this about Jehovah God who was speaking to David's Lord having reference to Jesus Christ. If David calls him Lord, he said, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. The reason that they were not able to answer Jesus in that question is because they weren't willing to accept that Jesus was the Messiah. That this reference to the Messiah, of course, would be something fulfilled in the ministry and in the and death and the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. But this was an understanding that the religious world didn't have at that time, and one of the reasons why Jesus himself was rejected. Now, the, the statement that the Lord said to my Lord, so we're referring here to Jehovah, and you might note that uh, in the first verse, if you have a, 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 a passage or in your Bible, uh, the uh, small caps that is used to designate Jehovah, capital L, and then a capital O-R-D, but just half size. Well, whenever you see that, that is uh, the Hebrew word Yahweh, or that which is translated Jehovah, and that is the term that is used. So, to reread it, because you'll notice that the second Lord does not have that, the Lord said to my Lord, capital L, little O-R-D, that has reference to the Greek word Adonai, when you look in the Septuagint. So we have Jehovah saying to Adonai. And now what do we mean by the word Adonai? Well, that, that particular word uh, has reference to a ruler or a sovereign master or a lord. And here, of course, Jesus attributes that to himself as the Messiah, that Jesus is both king and priest. And we want to note here that he rules with a rod of strength in the midst of his enemies. Now, there are a number of things that are not mentioned in our, or will not be mentioned in our study, because there are references to the, uh, the ones that will follow after Jesus, and there is also a reference to the final judgment that Jesus renders that we're not actually going to emphasize in our lesson today. We're going to talk about three figures that are mentioned here, king, rod, and priest. And I just want to address those very quickly as we get into our discussion. So first of all, note that the Messianic kingdom with Christ as king is a central tenet of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now when we hear the gospel preached, and I want you to note that the first time that an actual gospel sermon was preached was on the day of Pentecost. Jesus told things about himself. He made intimations about what the kingdom would be like. He, uh, he established that uh, he would start or establish his kingdom and the gates of Hades would not pre prevail against it. But the first time that the Holy Spirit fell upon anyone to proclaim the gospel message was on the day of Pentecost found in the book of Acts in the second chapter where the apostle Peter began that sermon. And so in Acts chapter 2 and verses 36 through 38, uh, I want you to note, actually it's verses 32 through 36. I'm sorry I wrote that uh, down incorrectly uh, on the board. But Acts chapter 2 beginning of verse 32 and going through verse 36. Jesus, we are told, God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. And therefore, he was exalted to the right hand of God. Well, that's where his kingdom is. That's where his throne is, at the right hand of Jehovah God. And so being exalted, risen above all names, that in his name every knee should bow, he being exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see in here. David did not ascend into the heavens. He says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your Footstool. Now here is the key, verse 36 of the text. Let the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And so this is that fulfillment of what was predicted in the 110th Psalm, that Jesus is serving as Lord, one of which is a, 
um, certainly an indication of his kingship, the fact that he is a king in his kingdom. And the Hebrew writer emphasized basically the same thing, proclaiming the preeminence of Jesus Christ as the anointed of God in Hebrews chapter 1. In the first three verses of that text, he said at various times, and in various ways, in times past, he spoke to the fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And notice, concerning this Jesus, he appointed him to be heir of all things, and through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Well, this again is an indication of where the majesty, where the kingship is to be found, on high, in heaven, in that spiritual place. And, and here we are told that he contrasted Jesus even with the angels. He is much better than the angels as he has been in inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they as indicated in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 4. Now all of that to bring us to verses 8 through 13 of Hebrews. I want you to listen very closely to the words in capital as these things are proclaimed in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8 that to the Son, God says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness, hated lawlessness, Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are work of your hands. They'll perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. To which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand? Till I make all of your enemies your footstool. So again, this is the kingship of Jesus Christ, and his kingdom remains and will remain until all enemies are made his footstool. That means that they will be absolutely and completely defeated. So we're talking about Jesus, first of all, as king. Now understand that under Judah, under the old covenant, under the old law, the only ones who could serve as king were from Judah, but you may remember that it is indicated in this text as well that he serves as priest, which we'll address in a moment. So Jesus is different in that he reigns both as king, but also as priest at the same time. Now look again at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24, because there in verse 24, the end will come. That is that judgment of God. We are told he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father. The kingdom is in existence. Jesus will one day deliver it, deliver it to the Father when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. He will remain on his throne until all enemies will be defeated and put at his feet at his footstool. He said he has put all things under his feet. When he says that, it is evident he who put all things under him is accepted. There is the Father in heaven who is accepted to that. And when all things are made subject to him, the Son, the Son himself, will also be subject to God who put all things under him that God may be all in all. So this God, Jehovah, has begun through establishing Christ's authority and reign in these last days. He has spoken to us as his Son. He has exalted him above all other names. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, Jesus came and he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. This is one of the problems that I have with individuals who claim that Jesus is not yet king. How can you not be king in every sense of the term if you have been given all authority in heaven and on earth? Now there were evidences that have been supplied through signs and miracles during his time on earth. There's the gospel today which breaks down borders to bring salvation to all who believe. As Romans 1 tells us, the gospel is the power of God to salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also for the Greek. So we have established Christ's authority and power to affect his Father's plan of redeeming man and granting for us the victory. And so that's the first point that we want to emphasize, that Christ is our King. And as our King and as our Lord, we ought to humbly submit ourselves to him. 
But one aspect of his kingship that we want to indicate is the fact that he will rule with a rod. Now, we talked about that a little bit in our study of Isaiah in the second period or the second hour of our study together. But Christ's rule is with strength. And I want you to think of that rod or that scepter as an indication of the strength. It's strength that is used sometimes to refer to chastisement. It is sometimes referred to as, as something that is a signification of royalty and authority. But also it is used with regard to strength and certainly with regard to honor. Notice in, in Isaiah chapter 11, in verses 1 through 4, again, we've already alluded to this. There will come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is a reference to the Christ. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor is aside by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the poor. He will decide with equity for the meek and the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. So this idea of a rod is indeed a rod of punishment, but in his strength we find equity and we find righteousness or honor with which uh, we are reigned by Jesus Christ. Now, as we alluded to, the word rod, meaning a branch or a staff, or another word that is used in Scripture to indicate basically the same as that of a, of a scepter, it's associated with royalty. We're told in Psalm 45 and verse 6 of the text that your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And so the concept of the rod indicates Christ's authority, uh, and power and his eventual victory that is obtained through him. It's, it's a constant theme of scripture. It is, it is one we come across time and time again. You'll notice that I have up on the board two passages from the book of Revelation. And of course, Revelation is a book of pictures. And so it's a vivid look at, at the might that Jesus will wield against our enemies and his victorious uh, victory over our enemies. So notice these two verses. Revelation 2.25, Christ's letter to uh, Thyatira, the church of, of Thyatira is indicated in verses 25 through 29. And he told them, he said, hold fast to what you have till I come. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them. This is a quotation concerning the Jesus. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. As I have received from my Father... And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so this is, this is what we will receive. Those who are righteous, the morning star. But those who are unrighteous, because of his goodness, his honor, his glory, the might of his power will be sent as a rod of iron to dash them in pieces who do not serve God. And of course, in Revelation 19 and verse 11, we find the imagery of the Christ on the white horse who comes and gains victory over the Antichrist and over the beast, or the beast and the false prophet. In verse 11, notice this. I saw heaven opened. <clears throat> Behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Now this is Jesus Christ that is referred to here. His eyes were like a flame of fire, on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth, we are told, a sharp sword went, where he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. And he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his road and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so Jesus Christ serves as king and reigns in his kingdom today. And he reigns with a rod of iron. And he will bring his justice upon the ungodly. 
but also with righteousness and with mercy and with honor and the promise that he has given to those who serve him of eternity is something that he has the power and the might and the willingness to supply to each and every one of us who know his name. Now, the third and final point that we want to gather in our lesson today, and again, there is much more that we could take from the text, but we're supplying just these three points, and that is that Christ also serves as high priest as well as our king on the throne. You'll notice verse 4 of the text, the Lord has sworn, will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now for those who are not familiar with the term, I think most of you are, we've studied this before, but Melchizedek was the king of Salem, which was a word for the city of Jerusalem early on, a long time ago during the time of Abraham. And you'll remember when Abraham went to war that he was blessed by the king of Salem. We're told in Genesis 14 and verse 18 that Melchizedek was the king of Salem. He brought out bread and wine, and he also was a priest of the Most High God. This was prior to uh, Levi's tribe being the tribe chosen to have the priesthood. Before the house of Aaron was the house that was taken to be of the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood. It was before the old law was established. We find the greater imagery here in this text of Melchizedek blessing Abraham, Melchizedek, without beginning or without end, being the individual who antipathies, uh, excuse me, who, uh, who typifies, uh, Jesus being the antipathy of, he typifies Jesus Christ as king. Now I want you to go now uh, to Hebrews chapter 5. We find very quickly the fulfillment of this, the explanation that is given to us by inspiration of what actually happened. He said that Christ didn't glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he, that is God, who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, this is Psalm 110, this is a quotation from the text, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, he was heard by his godly fear. This is what happened to Jesus. He prayed in that garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed from the crucifixion. Though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. He is priest, isn't he? We've already talked about that. But this text indicates that he was called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, and there is much more that we can say about that. And in fact, there is much more we can discuss. But unfortunately, the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 5, they just were not able to fully understand what it was that he said because they had become dull of hearing. So uh, we find in Hebrews chapter 7, the argument actually expressed very quickly. Melchizedek, again, was the king and priest of Salem. We were told that he had no beginning or end. Now, that doesn't mean that he didn't buy he did, wasn't born and that he didn't die. It's just that the Bible has absolutely no, no record of that happening. As far as we know, we have this man who comes onto the picture just for a few moments to bless Abraham, to typify Jesus Christ as both king, king of Salem, and high priest of the Most High God who would typify the coming of the New Covenant where one high priest would reign, not high priests who die and change, no changing from one or another, and no necessity of offering up sin offerings for themselves. But Jesus Christ, the single high priest, who remains alive forever in heaven, makes petition for us, having died and offered up himself on the cross of Calvary, one sacrifice, once for all, and he is the mediator between us and and God. So notice Hebrews 7 verse 24 what it said. That he having reference to Christ as that antitype of Melchizedek because he continues forever, Jesus continues forever, he has an unchangeable priesthood and therefore he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, 
undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. And I would say to you that as thrilling as it is for us to talk about the power and the glory of Christ as the victorious one, as the winner of our battles, as the royal one sitting on his throne, it is every bit as stirring to hear of him as the unchangeable high priest who offered himself up once for all for our eternal redemption. And so it's an important psalm. It is an absolutely wonderful psalm, and I would encourage you to read it again and again and again to get those three points established from that. So the concluding thoughts that I wanted to share with you in that we didn't cover all of the psalm, we see from the psalm that Christ is our king and our priest, and that enables him to successfully bring redemption to us as man. Now this design has been in the mind of God from before the beginning of the world. Wonderful passage of scripture in Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. He chose us in him from before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace in which he made us accepted in the beloved, that's in Christ, and in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. He made known to us the mystery of his will. Notice it's no longer a mystery. It has been made known according to the good pleasure in which he purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, 2,000 years ago, it all began, the mystery fully revealed, Christ doing the work that God had given him to do to redeem man, we are told that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and are on earth, in him. And we have the Father and Son working together, securing for us the redemption that we enjoy, that we enjoy as children of God. And so it's a, it's a great and wondrous. When you start talking about the scheme of redemption, we talked about uh, getting those shivers down our spine. Every aspect of it brings that to me and I hope that I've been able to supply some essence of that to you in the description of this of this psalm but understand this that Jesus Christ died but after three days he was raised from the dead and what that means and that he did not die again is he is still alive and having been made alive and remaining alive today he has shown his victory over death and if you want to spend an eternity in heaven, after your life on earth is over, you can live eternally in the presence of God because of Jesus Christ. Because he is your king. Because he is your high priest. Because he is your sin sacrifice. And all that you must do is to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God? Well, then come forward and confess that to those who are assembled here. Repent of your sins and turn away from them. Be baptized to have your sins washed away. And based upon that obedient faith, you too will receive the forgiveness of your sins and the hope of eternal life. We offer that invitation to you. If there is anyone here who has a need to respond in any way to the invitation call, we call upon you now to come forward. While together we stand and while we sing.